We are excited to welcome Dr. Victoria Worth back to MSU for a session about skin findings associated with myositis, autoantibodies, and skin care. Dr. Victoria Worth is a professor of dermatology and medicine at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and chief of dermatology at the Philadelphia VAMC. She is an internist and dermatologist with a practice devoted to autoimmune skin diseases. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Worth. We appreciate your commitment to our community. I have a few conflicts, which I'm uh, not going to be very relevant to what we talk about today, uh, but it re reflects the fact that there's now more interest in dermatomyositis and more uh, wanting to do studies, by, uh, and which is a good thing for the people who have the disease. So um, I'm going to talk about antibodies just because lately there's been an awareness that they can be a little bit predictive of, of the disease phenotype. And by that meaning people can look different depending on, and the disease course might be slightly different depending on which autoantibody is present. And so we use these autoantibodies to help in the diagnosis and patient assessment. Uh, so part of it is to, if they're there, it can be helpful in terms of making a diagnosis and potentially help in complications and prognosis and then also develop a therapeutic strategy. So autoantibodies, are made by um, cells in your circulation, and they are part of the, normally the immune system fighting off infection. But as you know, in autoimmune disease, antibodies are generated and made against um, uh, proteins and often cross-reacting in the body and sort of attacking the skin or whatever organ, other organs might be involved, such as the muscles or the lungs. And so there's still a lot to be learned about the role of autoantibodies exactly, and nobody's very sure if they're is that pathogenic or whether they're sort of something that comes along with the disease but not necessarily causing the disease. And so, and it may well be that there are people who have the disease and don't have antibodies. So here's a list of different antibodies, and there's quite a few of them, and you've probably heard of some of them. These include things like anti-MI2, anti-MDA5, uh, anti-155-140, which is otherwise known as KIP-1 gamma, uh, uh, anti-MJ, which is NXP2, and anti-SAE. Now, if you look all the way to the right, you can see that I've written down certain clinical features that might be seen in association um, with these antibodies. And so we, sometimes people who have one antibody like MI2 might start out with um, more skin, and then they may get more muscle, but the, the muscle disease is responsive to treatment. MDA5 can be quite a variable course, but some people with MDA5 can get rapidly progressive uh, interstitial lung disease and may have ulcers in their skin and papules on their uh, palms. And so that disease course can be more um, severe and significant and require more aggressive treatment. Uh, tip 1 gamma, we hear about in terms of potentially being cancer associated, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I can tell you that tip 1 gamma is common, and it's not common to have cancer. And so it's uh, depending on where you read and what you read, um, anywhere from 20% or so people have cancer or may get cancer when they have tip 1 gamma. It may be higher, and there may be isotypes that we're going to eventually know more about how to measure that will be more predictive. So one of the problems is though, when you get an antibody and, and you read you know, across the line, it says cancer associated, then you think if you have the antibody, you're gonna get cancer. And I, and I really wanna reassure people that in fact, we're not that good at predicting right now. And many people have this antibody and don't have cancer. Then there's NXP2, as I told you, that can be seen more in kids with dermatomyositis and also with calcinosis and an association with cancer can happen as well. And then there are patients who get CADM, which is clinically amyopathic DM, which means more skin, <coughs> excuse me, and less muscle, uh, although you can get muscle and with the anti-SAE and less likely lung. So these are really more just a little bit like a guide, but they're not very, you know, they're never gonna be 100%. <coughs> In addition, there's an anti-synthetase antibodies, which are found in people who have interstitial lung disease more often than not. Um, I mean, when they have these antibodies, we think more about interstitial lung disease. And you can see that's a long list there. And so when, now when people get antibodies checked, they're often getting 12 different antibodies or more, um, some of which are, are myositis specific and some that are myositis associated. But if we see somebody has a JO1 or PL7 or PL12 or some of these other antibodies, then we worry a little bit more, could this person have lung disease? <clears throat> 
So the antisynthetase syndrome it means that you have at least one antibody and then can often have either interest for lung disease or myositis or arthritis. And that those are things that can be seen. And they can also, um, when you have this antibody, have fever, ray nodes, and mechanics hands, which is roughness on the sides of the fingers and on the palms. The anti-MDA5, as I told you, where you get this more rapidly progressive interstitial lung disease in some patients, not everybody, is more common in Asia and in particular Japan, where a lot of the people with, who are MDA5 get rapidly progressive ILD. And it seems to be a less prevalent problem in the United States. Um, Anti-nuclear proteins are, we've talked about, but these are basically antibodies against um, proteins that are in the nucleus. Or, and so, you know, that, that explains, again, it's uh, antibodies made against your own tissue. So anti-MDA5, I told you there were ulcers, and this is an example of a kind of ulcer, like a punched out ulcer over the uh, hand that can happen. And probably, you know, depending on, there aren't that many case series of how many, how often we see this, but in one, there was 13% of patients who had skin lesions had anti-MDA5 antibodies in the sera. Um, and then uh, in people who have this, and there's more lung disease, these ulcers, palmar papules, and you can see the hand there on the right that is more of a mechanics hand that we see that sometimes in MDA5. You can have sores in the mouth and you can have alopecia, hair loss. So again, punched out ulcer. And these, this is the arthritis that you can get and also the ulcers, which can be um, very difficult and problematic. And we definitely treat with um, a number of different agents for this kind of problem. This is again, mechanics hands with scale and erythema on the sides of the hands. And you can see erosions on the tip of the thumb. And these can be pretty painful um, and uh, require often treatment. So, and then on the right here, you can see the palmar papules. Um, which can be seen in MDA5. You can see it in other elements as well, other uh, subtypes of dermatomyositis as well. <clears throat> and then this is looking at uh, mechanics hands. Um, and basically mechanics hands is uh, where you have um, symmetric, non-pyritic, scaly um, areas on the hands. And I showed you the pictures. It's often on the thumb and the index finger and the middle finger and it can go onto the surface of the palm of the hand and distal fingertip. And then this is showing mechanics hands again, but also Gotrin. So on the, on the hand to the left, you can see erythematous um, uh, areas on the, on the joints. And on the right, you can see that there's, an, again, this inverse pattern where you can see the erythema like in the area of the joints, but on the palm. All right, so then this is looking at the association between various clinical findings. And this is just to mention that if you have Gotrin's papules, it's actually a little less likely um, to have lung disease. If you have mechanics hands, you're more likely going to have uh, 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 lung disease. And so again, looking at the skin, thinking about the antibodies, what's predictive, these are just generalities, but again, something to think about. So in terms of mechanics hands and antibodies, we did one study which showed that quite a number of people, um, the number of the patients had uh, mechanics hands in our population. And of those, 71% had anti tif one gamma. Uh, and so again, another antibody that we hadn't described as being associated with mechanics hands. And we can see that with many different antibodies. And mechanics hands is not specific for one antibody. And a lot of people, by the way, don't have antibodies. And so I often tell people, if we're gonna check a myositis panel, not to think that um, if it's negative, you don't have dermatomyositis because frequently it's negative and, um, and it's not a very, right now, very uh, reliable test, uh, a little bit like a lupus test. So they're not as reliable as we would like. Now, this is looking at uh, and what happens in terms of trying to, again, characterize different subtypes. And you can see the antisynthetase syndrome in the middle there with the nice orange. And that's again with the mechanics, hands, the nodes, the arthritis, and attempts to figure out where to put people who have skin disease and what antibodies do you see. And if you have calcium, what are the antibodies that you might see there? Um, and, and so NXP2 associates with that. And then if there's an overlap with other connective tissue problems, then you can sometimes see other antibodies as well.
Um, although you can see those antibodies like the KU and uh, RMP and Ro and La in people who have just dermatomyositis. So it's just a really uh, an idea of how to think about what the significance is of all these different antibodies. And, and, and they're not, again, it's an attempt to make a Venn diagram to better understand the disease, but no, nobody kind of reads the books all the time and we see lots of exceptions. So um, my point being here is that mechanics hands are not really something that's specific for antisensitase syndrome. You can see it in really just about every subtype of dermato that we can think about, whether it be polymyositis or patients with classic DM, meaning muscle and skin, or uh, uh, those who have more skin, and in people who don't even have an antibody at all. And then on biopsy, often if you do that of mechanics hands, you see uh, interface dermatitis, which is a type of uh, inflammation at the, um, at, the, at the intersection between the top layer of skin and the second layer in skin. And you see lymphocytes that are infiltrating those areas that we uh, think are you know, part of the, the disease process. So going back then in more detail, I wanted to go through TIF1 gamma because you know, the, the interest has been in um, trying to define what people look like potentially or what they're more likely to look like if they have a TIF1 gamma. Um, and so here you, they can look a little bit more like psoriasis, uh, less calcinosis, maybe a little more malignancy, um, less ILD, um, less Raynaud's, less arthritis, arthralgias, and mild myositis. So these are all the kinds of associations we think about at TIF1 gamma. And if you compare this back to what we said about MDA5, clearly there are differences here, right? MDA5 is, you know, more long, um, you know, less malignancy. So there's, we, we think that these antibodies do give us some additional information, but they're not perfect. Then also with TIF1 gamma, you can get um, sort of more, uh, darker and lighter areas in the skin or telangiectasias, which are part of the damaged part of the disease. Um, also flagellate erythema and also blisters sometimes can happen. And then if you look um, in people with cancer, there was one study that suggested maybe some people have a higher antibody level uh, in the presence of cancer, but that hasn't been verified and, and usually the report isn't gonna be giving a high a level of the TIP1 gamma. So again, talking about what does this look like? So on the left is on the abdomen, scaly erythema, it could be psoriasis, but the biopsy would show that interface dermatitis, the, the lymphocytes and inflammation. On the right, you know, more scaly over the, uh, over the joints, and that's uh, part of a Gotrans, but it's a specific look to the Gotrans because there's more scale. And then also sometimes something called red on white, which can be another thing that you can see. Uh, with a very different pattern of uh, inflammation in the skin. And then on the Palmer side with the TIF1 gamma, you can see I mean, sometimes this, uh, just like we saw over the joint, also in the, uh, on the Palmer surface, you can have hyperkeratotic papules as well. So that brings me to NXP2. Um, and this is involved with uh, a response to oncogenic signals. And if you have an antibody blocking it, that might be one of the reasons why um, there's an increased risk of malignancy, but it's not that common, maybe 10% in one cohort. And the associations are more men have this, dysphagia, myalgias, um, peripheral edema, uh, calcinosis, maybe less, um, my, less amyopathic and less mild skin, uh, less Gotrin sign and increased risk of malignancy. So again, trying to categorize you know, what the risks are with each antibody, I think over time when the antibody tests get better and we can tell better what they mean, um, you know, that we can detect them, then it will, it will hopefully give us the ability to look at broader uh, groups of patients and be sure about these associations. And then here is anti, the anti-SAE, which is less common, often gets skin first and then can progress on to muscle and dysphagia. So in terms of the MI2, this is not uncommon, like 20% of adult dermato. And you often get the very typical changes of dermatomyositis with the heliotrope, the Gotrans, V-neck sign, Shaw sign, cuticular overgrowth, and photosensitivity. And myositis is usually mild to moderate, low lung and joint involvement, and steroid responsive and monophasic. 
So overall, it's good to have this kind of antibody because if, if it's responsive and, and goes away and stays away, that's all, something I think everybody would like to, to experience. So how often is uh, our antibodies um, detected? And so we did a study here at Penn where we had 378 patients who had a myositis panel done just through our lab. And, um, and then 10% had a myositis specific antibody and 20% had a myositis associated antibody. And that's all comers. Anybody who had a lab test done for the myositis panel, whether or not they had dermata, that's what we found. And those cat we thought the people, who, then when we went through the charts and this rated whether we thought the person was probably or definitely had dermatomyositis or polymyositis or clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis. And you can see that the rates of antibody positivity were still pretty low. I mean, it was 14% for myositis specific and 21% for myositis associated. And this is just showing you as a figure what that looks like. But the rate of positive myositis with specific antibody by final diagnosis, you can see is that mostly all of them except for the definite dermato were below 20%. And some of them were really far below. But That's one shocking thing to me. Well, you know, I think that um, it is shocking, uh, but I think part of it is that um, uh, the antibody detection methods are not that good, and they're getting better, but it's so far from standardized that, uh, you know, this is still pretty much the experience we have, but this is pooling data from probably the last five or six years. I'd have to go back to check for sure. sure. But, um, and I do think as time goes on, hopefully, if we were going to repeat this study, you know, it, it will get better. But um, that's my point, it's just that if you have a negative antibody, it doesn't mean you don't have dermato. So um, the rate of uh, antibody, so this was using commercial myositis autoantibody uh, panels, and that, that's being done a lot. Um, but again, there's a lot of different tests that are going on in many labs, and there's not much, um, you know, I don't think there's a lot of, there's a few labs that are very, very excellent, but they're mostly research labs. Um, and then MSA was, the myositis specific antibody was found again, and a minority of patients. All right, so I've kind of finished the autoantibody section. I don't know, did you want to entertain questions about that before I move on to treatment? We sure can. Okay. Let's see, I have a question um, from Elizabeth. Uh, if you have autoantibodies when diagnosed, will you always have them? So the antibody titers, I mean, a lot of people have not, had done that test to see how they do sequentially over time, and if they get better, do they get do the antibodies go away? But there is there are a few studies that suggest some of the antibodies do improve, um, and although often you can still uh, detect them, they may be at a lower titer. But we don't have a huge amount of data um, about that right now. And a follow up to that was. Uh, are antibodies different for amyopathic dermatomyositis as opposed to classic dermatomyositis? That's a great question. So not, not exactly. I mean, you know, I think the rate of antibodies that we discussed, you know, is probably even a little bit lower in the amyopathics and the classics. Um, and, you know, so, so it speaks to, you know, what, what are antibodies important or do we not know how to detect them or are there different antibodies? And I don't think we 100% know the answer to that, but many patients with amyopathic can still have the same antibodies that other people with classic DM get. We have one lady who has asked the question, what is monophasic and do symptoms not really come and go? So that's a great question. So, um, you know, very often dermato is either there and kind of constant or it can wax and wane with, you know, despite treatment. Um, but there are subsets of people, and we talked a little bit about that with the MI2 antibody, that, you know, you treat them, and they get better, and they stay better. And I definitely have patients like that, which I'm sure everybody would like to be one of those patients. But uh, yeah. that would be what we consider monophasic, like you get treated, and it goes away. Okay. And sometimes that just ne it just never reappears? Yeah. I mean, I definitely have seen pe people like that. Wow. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, and we have one more here. <clears throat> Uh, which just wants some uh, lady wants some, some clarification. So, is it possible to have positive antibodies in the myositis panel and not have a myositis diagnosis? So, I mean, then it gets to the question of why would the why would the antibodies be checked at all? 
Mm -hmm. And with, with any kind of test, you know, there's always this risk of like the ANA, the, you know, there's a certain number of false positives. And so myositis PL should probably only be ordered in people where you have a suspicion that they might have myositis. Mm -hmm. um, but so I don't know how often, you know, we've looked at, at, at normals and, you know, I don't know that we have that, that exact data. I mean, in time, maybe as the tests get more standardized, we will. Uh, and, but I can tell you when I order it, it's going to be because I'm thinking about the myositis, and if I'm lucky enough for it to come back positive, then I, you know, pretty much uh, it, that'll confirm my clinical impression. But very often it's the clinical impression that's driving things in the first place. Thank you. So we know that um, that there are certain uh, inflammatory markers that are found in skin and uh, blood and muscle uh, that correlate with skin activity. The CDASI is a way to measure skin activity, and we know that when people have moderate or severe disease, we see these inflammatory markers in the blood even um, that are in some, again, the part of it is the, if you look at the A panel, it's looking at a gene signature for type one interferon, and you can see that it goes up in people who have, this is, the higher the number on this axis, the worse the skin disease. And so you can see when you have a very low amount of skin activity, you don't get that gene signature for uh, the, the interferon. Um, and, uh, and, but if you get to uh, a point where you have worse activity, you can see there's really clearly you can detect um, the gene signature in the blood. Uh, in the serum, you can find interferon beta, and that correlates also with the degree of activity. So the more activity in the skin, the higher the amount of the inflammatory protein that you can see. And in the interferon beta can regulate various chemokines that can bring in inflammatory cells into the skin and muscle. And you can see here also that with worse skin disease, you get more of these CXCL10 chemokine in the blood. I mean, it's not even in the skin, it's in the blood. And we know that other interferons, like interferon alpha, really doesn't seem to correlate very much with what we see um, in, uh, in the blood in patients with uh, dermatomyositis. And this is really in distinction to what we see in lupus, where there is interferon alpha. So this is just showing that if you get better uh, in terms of the skin activity, it really improves the way that people feel. Their emotion score improves. Um, and so this is just looking at people who got their skin score better enough in the visit two that their emotional score came down. Um, and whereas here, non-responders, people where the activity doesn't get better, the, the score stays still you know, the same and elevated. And so what this tells us is that if, if we can treat people and make their skin better in the case of, we're talking about skin today pretty much, um, then it improves their quality of life and how they feel and their symptoms of itch and so on. And that's sort of obvious to a certain extent, but this is a way of proving it and then also a way of thinking about how to measure this in, clini in clinical trials. So in terms of the way to treat, so first-line therapies would be things like a sunscreen. And often people will say, oh, I use sunscreen in my makeup, like a 15, you know, is in there. And, but what happens is with makeup, you don't take it on. And so it's often not gonna even be a 15. And you need really a higher sunscreen in order to help in terms of a photosensitive condition. And so you really need to be using like 70 or 100 SPF and with, often with a, a UVA block or else with zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, a physical blocker. These things will protect your skin much better when you have a photosensitive condition. So you have to think of this a little bit differently than you do preventing skin cancers or photo damage. It's really, um, it doesn't take much to trigger problems for some people in the skin. So use the sunscreens, you know, when you get up in the morning, reapplying if you sweat um, or swim, um, and also trying to go out early in the morning, late in the afternoon. Uh, definitely going out on the beach is a problem for people, uh, it can be. And if you're under an umbrella and you think you're in the shade, but there's a, you're surrounded by water or, you know, sand, the, the sun can bounce off of the uh, sand or the water and get underneath the umbrella. And you feel like you're in the shade, but you're still getting like 60% of the light that's coming in under the umbrella. So you, I really advise using like um, good uh, sunscreen shirts and hats and trying not to be out in the middle of the day if possible. So these are all things that can be helpful before you even get to talking about anything more like other treatments. 
Um, and if you have um, problems, then with the skin, we often will add in a topical steroid, and there are many different types of steroids and names and strengths. And so you want to work with your doctor to make sure you get one that's not too strong for a face. For instance, you might use a stronger one on a hand so if they're really bothering you. But we use a lot of topical steroids, and they can be helpful. We also sometimes um, will use injections in the scalp, for instance, if there's loss of hair and there's inflammation in the scalp with red and scale, and it's a limited area, then you might think about an injection. And we also use um, uh, something called uh, permicrolimus or tacrolimus, and those are very good to try to um, anti-inflammatory. They're not steroids, so they don't thin out the skin, and they can often help um, people who uh, especially on the face and thinner skin uh, to try to decrease the amount of inflammation. I would say after that, if, if these approaches are not working or you have widespread disease, we will often think about using antimalarials such as hydroxychloroquine. And hydroxychloroquine, we um, usually take, um, uh, have a very specified dosing based on body weight. Um, and it can be helpful for some patients, but not for everybody, and probably only works in about a quarter or a third of people. There's about a 20% chance of getting a skin rash from the hydroxychloroquine. So if you get a rash after you start it, you have to sort of call your doctor and stop taking it because it could be that it's causing a, a separate rash. Um, but the reason we use it, and despite all of this, because it works for some people, and in some ways, it's a lot easier than having to go on other approaches to therapy like immunosuppressants and things like that. We have other animalarials that I've listed there that we sometimes will use in combination, quinacrine with hydroxychloroquine or switching from hydroxychloroquine to chloroquine to see if that will help. Now, I do want to digress a little bit to talk about something that I'm really concerned about, which is um, triggers for dermato. And we have been seeing very many patients with dermato lately. And some of them can really, really relate to um, either having a new onset of their disease after taking um, like a, this thing, Isoline, which is a weight loss powder that's a very big industry. Um, and if you have Dermato and you take this, you can have a flare, and we've had that happen as well. And so we've been trying to advise people really to stay away from herbal preparations, this kind of weight loss powder, because many of them have effects on the immune system, and they boost the immune system, and people aren't aware of it. And so um, when we talk to our patients, we now take a rather detailed history about when they come in about what, what, what are the things that they're using as herbal medications. And it's surprising how often people will have taken things like spirulina, chlorella, echinacea, things that definitely stimulate the immune system and often starting it just before getting, you know, it's a short time before getting their disease. And the other thing is you might think you don't take those things, but if you actually look at the uh, green drinks, the green algae and chlorella are, and spirulina are, are in many of them. And many supplements have these just added in. And so you really have to read the ingredients on the back of the bottle and be very, very careful if you have dermatomyositis not to take in uh, something that might actually make you worse. And this is showing the hands of somebody who had a flare after taking isoline. And this is the biopsy that showed a lot of interface dermatitis, the blue cells and the, and the separation of the top layer from the second layer. It can make it be a trigger or it can make them worse. And we've actually done some studies in our lab to try to look at what happens when you take isoline at a very dilute concentration. And by that meaning like 0.05 or 0.5 micrograms per ml, when you add it to, um, to peripheral blood mononuclear cells from people who have dermatomyositis, it stimulates the production of inflammatory proteins and what we call cytokines. So this is looking at TNF and interferon alpha and look at this interferon beta. And it goes way up when we add this to diluted amount to the cells. And so it's really important, I think, to be aware that these things can trigger the immune system to make um, these kind of inflammatory uh, proteins that can be dangerous. Anyway, so this is just to tell you that we've been working out the mechanism of how this can be stimulated um, use, using uh, through different things called toll receptors. And we've been able to show that you can block the toll receptor and you don't get that upregulation. So they're, we're trying to understand how this could be working. And we've really talked about most of this, but I also wanted to bring on the idea that we use Cerna lotion for itch. So if you have a really itchy skin, getting over the counter Cerna lotion, which has menthol in it, can be really helpful instead of scratching, which can make the itch worse. Um, for emollients, things like Vaseline, Eucerin can be helpful if your skin's just 
scaly and, uh, and dry. Um, antihistamines we sometimes will give just for itch because itch is a big part of this. And um, they work to some extent, but they're not perfect. But things like Adorax or um, Zyrtec, Benadryl, they can be helpful. They help you sleep if nothing else. And then second line therapies include immunosuppressants, and I've listed a number of them here. Um, and there are different reasons to use these for different people, but they can be helpful, and, and we often have to use these for people who don't respond to antimalarials. We do use glucocorticoids sometimes, but we try not to because of all the systemic side effects when you take oral steroids. Um, and so we use them when there's muscle or lung and bad skin, but usually for the skin, more like a bridge until we find the right therapy to be able to get off the steroids. IVIG can be helpful, and, and so that's something that some people go on to try to help their skin. Um, and it can be effective, but it's very um, time consuming. You have to be hooked up to an IV for three to five days uh, um, for two hour sessions uh, once for one week out of the uh, month. And um, there are some side effects with headaches and clots and things like that. So it's something we do because it works for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for everybody and it has its own problems. And it's quite costly as well. There are some interesting studies that are going on with JAK inhibitors, um, which are available off-label but hard to get because it's not approved for dermatomyositis. But that's something that we sometimes think about using also for people who are having trouble. Topacitinib is an example of that. And then there are new therapies under investigation, and this is a very exciting time because there really are companies that are interested in pursuing for a rare disease better therapies, and I think that um, we want to really encourage that. So basically, um, if you uh, look at this, there's some very good treatments available for, that are under investigation, and if your disease is not well controlled and you've already been through a lot of treatments, you may think about participating in trials because Again, I think there's a real big need to come up with better treatments in the future. So I'm just listening here, uh, some of the major ones that are, uh, there's an ongoing anti-interferon beta uh, trial that's going on. And I told you interferon beta is an important <clears throat> cytokine. And so if you block it, you know, potentially it could be very helpful for people. Hi, um, Hyzentra is sub-Q IVIG, which is gonna be studied also for dermatomyositis. A beta sep um, is gonna be tried. It has effects on downregulating the T cells. And then um, linobasin, which is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid. We did the phase two trial, and now there's an ongoing phase three trial. It's a global trial, and we hope that this will also uh, give better um, access to fairly safe treatment for um, people with dermatomyositis. So I'm happy to entertain any questions at this point about um, possible treatments for skin related to dermatomyositis. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, um, the lady. Uh, who asks, and I have this problem myself with dermatomyositis, but she says she thinks she's also sensitive to indoor lights. Can you comment on that? Well, there is certainly, uh, especially the unfiltered lights, uh, um, fluorescent lights, there is UV light that's emitted from those. And because your people are very photosensitive, they definitely can flare. Um, and so one thing to do is to make sure that you know, if you're in an office that has fluorescent lights, that at least there's a cover, acrylic cover, um, so that you're not getting as much um, light. I mean, there are light meters you could use to try to make sure you're, you're not getting over amounts of light. And, you know, you want to try to be careful about not, not um, being directly under unfiltered light. And one other comment uh, <clears throat> that I have here from the chat box. Um, she says she's been using the tacrolimus ointment for a long time. Her condition became worse. She got hot and ver and had uh, sore spots under her glasses. She convinced her dermatologist that she had an underlying infection. After she started using Metrogel, it got a lot better, but is still red and sometimes hurt. Any suggestions as to next possible treatment? Well, it just isolated in that one area. Um, you know, Metrogel is you know, not, is not harmful at all. But, um, you know, the other possibility is just that very often, I, I think the anti-inflammatories don't work as well as they should. Um, you could think about a, a topical steroid for a short time if it's really inflamed and bothersome, uh, like a hydrocortisone two and a half percent cream can be tolerated on the face for some, you know, period of time, not, not forever, but for a short time. Um, and so, you know, typically, uh, that might be one approach to try to change the, the topicals a little bit to see if that will help. 
Uh, Brooke, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. Um, <clears throat> she says that she never had bad flare-ups from the sun until she started taking Plaquenil. Um, do you think that it's because of the medication or just part of her disease progression? You know, it's very often hard to tell the difference between a side effect from a drug and the disease itself. But if somebody's put on Plaquenil, you know, it's because they have the disease, which can get worse. And Plaquenil, as I told you, for many people doesn't seem to be that effective. But it can be photosensitizing also for a small subgroup of people. And so if there was a clear difference after taking Plaquenil that didn't seem like it was somehow related to the underlying disease. Like you couldn't rule out the possibility that the drug was exacerbating it. We often see people flaring, you know, after we get them, put them on Plaquenil, like, you know, if they're going to get the drug eruption, it's often going to be, you know, two to three weeks later. Um, and, and it can be very uncomfortable. So it's good to identify it early on so you can stop the drug. Person here, but I do have a question about low dose naltrexone. If you're familiar with that, I'm on a Hyzentra sub Q, but I'm also on low dose naltrexone, which is 4.5 milligrams. And I wanted to know your opinion on that. So, I mean, there's a lot of interest in naltrexone. We don't have a lot of data in terms of dermatomyositis. I have patients that are on it that are still quite active. So I can't really comment because I don't think it's been studied very carefully. Okay. Thank you. My doctor put me on Celisep after failing on Plaquenil. Um, I've been on um, the Celisep now for about four months. He doubled the dose a month ago to uh, 1,000 uh, twice a day. I've just now started getting what I think might be some relief. I don't have the rash on my face as much anymore. Um, it's just now located, you know, on my arms. Um, do you see a lot of patients that generally don't um, have a, it doesn't actually have an effect on them until, you know, a few months in or well, should I think? Part of it is the dose, right? So you were on a pretty low dose for quite a while, and that can be discouraging. Um, not everybody tolerates Celsep, so you know at least you found out that the low dose was fine. But even a thousand twice a day, depending on your size, can be a low dose. And so it doesn't surprise me that, it, and it takes a month or so once you get to the right dose to start to work. So you might find that it will keep getting better, or you may have to bump the dose up even a little bit more. Okay, and the other question is, I've been on prednisone now for um, over a year. Um, now I'm finally down to 10 dose or 10 milligram dose, um, hoping to get off it because it obviously causes more problems than I like to deal with. Right. Um, but uh, what are your recommendations as far as tapering from that 10 milligram dose? Yeah, I mean, you know, and, well, I'm assuming you don't have muscle disease, it's more skin. Yes, mostly skin, yeah. So, you know, I think that if the cell stuff is starting to work, then, you know, there's no, you know, right answer. There are a lot of ways to taper steroids, and depending on how aggravated your skin is, you know, you, and you've also been on it a really long time, so you can taper by as little as one milligram, you know, every week or two. Um, you know, often when people get down to about three milligrams, we try to make sure the adrenal gland is working, because if you've been on a high dose for a while, it may stop working and it takes time to recover. Um, and you need to, you need to have uh, some, some steroid being made uh, as part of normal living. So, you know, but you know, it depends. As your cell stuff is working, you may have to get to a point where you'll be able to gradually taper your steroids. And the cell stuff also is causing a little bit of insomnia. Do you um, see that with many patients? Well, not so much insomnia, but you know, I think, the other part, you know, sometimes it's for me, I see more GI problems, stomach problems, but there is another drug called mycophenolic acid, which is the active ingredient of Celsept, and sometimes people tolerate that better than Celsept alone. So, you know, that would be another, you know, but I'm not sure, given that it's the active ingredient, you may end up with the same side effect <laughs> with, with, you know, with the mycophenolic acid, but I'm sure it can happen. I don't think it's so common. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Worth. Um, I did have another question uh, via email. Um, Tasha says she has a skin rash from dermatomyositis, and she's had this rash for over 20 years. Is there any way to even the skin tone? She was told by a dermatologist that my melanoma needs to be waking up and 
is it possible to have an even skin tone? Yeah, so people who have, you know, and I would, that gets to what the underlying skin type is. People with darker skin, when the inflammation goes away, and as they're healing, they can be left with more darker or lighter skin colors, and that can happen also to lighter skin people as well. And, you know, that can be slowly improved with, uh, I think what you, she's talking about is melanin being cleared by the inflammatory cells in the skin, and that can gradually make things go back to normal. But there are people who have darker, really darker skin where it may not go completely back to normal, but you can do things like wear sunscreen so that the darker areas don't get darker in the summer and you know, try to avoid things that'll be irritating to the skin and, and gradually they may lighten up, but the, you know, it's hard to know for sure. Evelina, I hope I got that right, uh, says that she does not have muscle involvement, but she has, she was originally diagnosed with DM by exam and symptoms, but now they are saying they think I do not have DM. My TIF one was 21 a year ago, and now it is 83. Why would that occur if I did not have myositis? Are there other diseases that would raise this level? So I'm not used to thinking of the actual levels of TIF one gamma, so I'm not sure what the significance of those are, but I'm assuming they're both positive, um, and you know, meaning that they're not more negative. Yeah. I, you know, and I, there's a lot more I would have to understand about, about this person to be able to comment. I mean, in, in terms of how the original diagnosis was made, what things look like. I mean, if the disease gets better, or the other point being that sometimes um, in the past when people had only skin, no muscle disease, um, there was no ability to make a diagnosis because the criteria for dermatomyositis insisted on having muscle disease. So for people who don't have muscle disease, it's still very hard to get a diagnosis. So there are some doctors who are aware of the fact that you can have dermato without muscle, but there's some that are not. And so that, may, that leads to a lot of problems with what the diagnosis actually is. Gina um, has a question about periorbital edema in DM um, and how to manage that. Yeah, well, that's not always so easy. Um, and that usually has to do with um, controlling the underlying inflammation. Very often there's erythema and edema at the same time. And so sometimes using a topical like, <clears throat> like tacrolimus around the, around the uh, eye can be helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, that there, but it depends on controlling the inflammation. However, that has to be done. How much UV, UVA, UVB exposure do I have inside of my house? I'm on the extreme end of the spectrum for photosensitivity. Right. <clears throat> well, it's hard to answer because, I mean, some people, you know, they have these really, like, very bright, you know, yeah. uh, lamps, and if they're not covered or they have direct, you know, uh, light exposure, then that would be probably fairly significant. Um, again, I think if you have lights that are covered, you know, either with a shade or acrylic, uh, you know, kind of cover, um, it becomes less, and less troublesome. But there are very cheap UVB meters that you can get and that will tell you exactly how much exposure you're getting. Hey, Julie has another comment about uh, what is safe for use around the eyes? Are any cortisone ointments okay? <laughs> well, I mean, if you use a cortisone there, you want to only use it for a short time because it can get through the eyelid and cause problems with glaucoma and cataracts. So we use it sometimes, but for short periods of time and not very strong ones, more like a, you know, hydrocortisone. Um, and then we often would recommend things like uh, protopic or tacrolimus uh, or pomicrolimus as, as uh, alternatives. And those can help with the area in the eye because the skin is very thin there. You just don't want it in the eye, but I would say that's a good approach. Mm -hmm. uh, Gina asks, uh, is there much evidence related to the use of IVIG with DM? And I'm su assuming she's uh, meaning that in the context of uh, helping arrest the skin. Yeah. So there was one study that was actually a long time ago, around 1993. It was one of the few controlled trials in dermatomyositis. And in that trial, they did show that IVIG was effective. Um, and if you, um, now with the Hyzentra trial, it'll be another way of showing that the sub-Q version, because that will be a randomized placebo-controlled trial, that'll be a good way of being able to tell you know, whether it's effective or not and it, with a different formulation. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you. Lynn, did you have anything else? 
Uh, no, I'm fine. Thank you. I have I had a few questions, but I have them answered. Thank you. Okay. Great. Wait. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Worth. We appreciate your time, and uh, we welcome you back anytime you have anything that you want to share, um, and we'll, we'll be in touch. Yeah, I hope that was helpful, and I think, you know, it's a good time of year to talk about sun protection and being careful about the sun, because I definitely noticed an uptick in um, disease activity, and, you know, trying to, be, and trying to be careful about the sun is very important. But thanks for all the great questions. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you. Have a wonderful day. Learn more about dermatomyositis and clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis at understandingmyositis.org backslash DM. Share your experiences living with or caring for someone with myositis at myositislife.org.